That's why I enjoyed the baking a happiness pie analogy because so many of us would love to consume the delicious pie and that would be great. But in actuality, we have to take action in these areas once we've recognized that this is a dead zone. This is meaningful. This is a pregret. This is something that I said I was going to do bucket list. And, you know, another year has gone by. A, a full pandemic has passed and I haven't changed anything. Yeah. Back to that pie. You know, I think a lot of people will think, well, you know, it's preordained. You know, the degree to which I'm going to be happy in life is something that, you know, 50% of it roughly is your biology. Um, and some of it is definitely going to be circumstance. You, a lot of researchers will debate the percentages, whether it's 10 or 20, but it is not as much as we think. You know, it's a, the external things that are around us, oh, like a pandemic or, oh, like your sort of socioeconomic status you were born into or et cetera. There are things that will happen, you know, a car accident or so on. Um, but again, back to the idea that we do generally adapt to things that happen to us. And then the rest is intentional action, which is exactly what we're talking about. Um, living a life worth fighting for, living a life worth living. So what do you say to our listeners who are on the verge of an existential crisis thinking about death? I say, I'm right there with you. I get you. Like, I like the idea about like getting to the cusp of an existential crisis. Like I want like an existential, um, I don't know. Episode, like not crisis. Yeah, episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like let's, let's just like, if we can take the dose, but uh, it's an indication that that it, that um, I think that life matters, and it is an indication that there is fear, of course, and it is one of the greatest anxieties. And I think what we can do is um, I find solace in the research that shows that sometimes our fear of death is ameliorated by living life more fully now. So there is an indication for some people that their their correlation, like I'm more afraid of death if I feel like I haven't done this life justice, so that. I'm going to get to the end and feel that sense of my life was left unlived. And so, well, my obvious answer is just the, like, well, then golly, we have a good, good opportunity here. Um, so I think that um, recognizing that if an existential crisis type moment is often at a, at a big key life event, like you were saying, AJ and Johnny, like you have clients that come and like something's gone on. And those I actually are, I'm grateful for in life. Like if we, without a catharsis, like without some kind of an event that is going to incite us to take change, then that is when we often sometimes just like we languish in that slumbering existence again for year after year and sometimes decade after decade. So on one hand, I'm like, thank you for this event. Yes, I recognize I am, you know, shitting my pants at the idea that my time is going to be temporary. And is there an area where I might be able to make a decision to live more fully that might help to assuage that? And they're like getting more intimate with that idea. And again, back to what we said, not in a just a general way, but in a really deep, reflective way about what have I done so far in my life that I'm proud of? What do I want to be able to look back on and say I was proud of? Like literally the way that I lived. And um, this is not a judgment about what life should look like, because this is very, I, this is not a prescription that your life needs to look or sound or feel a certain way, or, you know, you have to go to the following countries or concerts or events, right? It's like only you know what it helps, like when you feel like you've had, like this is my right dose of vitality and my right dose of meaning. And if we're being honest with ourselves, sometimes that's when we say, mm, you know, one, one area might, I mean, it might need to turn the dial up. But I think it's that introspection that we have to do and like recognize that in the grand scheme of, okay, I don't feel so hot about this, but I've got 1,830 of these Mondays left. And now if I'm going to prioritize, here are the things that I would love to take action on before that time. So that last piece, there's a level of self-compassion and forgiveness too for the past that I think is important as we start to wrestle with these regrets and thoughts of Mondays that weren't so great. Thanks for noticing that. Yeah. If we could all just give ourselves a permission slip to just like let that stuff go, because it it doesn't typically matter. And I like the research that is um, exists in the regret science about how most of us find a way, whether it's through cognitive dissonance or any other way to just understand that, yeah, you know, I did that dumb thing, you know, like, yeah, I was a jackass or yeah, I had the affair or I did the bad thing and like, mm, wish I hadn't. But the haunting comes from the belief that, oh, you know, I always wanted to try that thing, to start that business, to start that podcast or whatever it is. And like, I didn't, because that's an indication sometimes, like that's fear running the, running the roost. And, and that is not, um, for most people, like 
that's the thing that will make us feel like, could there have been a better version of my life? And could that version have been one where, let's be honest, maybe it didn't work out, but most people are more proud of themselves for giving it a go and not having it work than not giving it a go at all.